My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 164 of Legally Clueless. Thanks for rocking with the podcast. If this is your first time listening to an episode, welcome to the family. Audio episodes like this go out every single Monday. And feel free to join our Insta family. We're at Legally Clueless Africa. We're also using that same handle on TikTok. And if you want to chit chat about us on Twitter, please use the hashtag Legally Clueless. Oh, before I forget, check out our YouTube channel, which is Legally Clueless. You can watch the video series there and the tour series as well. So coming up in this episode is a story actually by a member of the Legally Clueless family who wrote in, filled the form, I reached out to her and we recorded this story a couple of weeks ago. Listen to this. My three cubemates were whispering to themselves and so I was like, okay, I guess it's time to wake up. <laughs> and so when I woke up, my bed was wet. And then she, she kind of like cooled down and she was like, okay, so how long has this been going on for? Do your parents know? Has this happened at home? And so she sent me to the nurse. And so they told me, you know what? Go to the hospital. It's not normal for someone past the age of five to be bedwetting. So I said, okay. Because my parents didn't even know in the first place. Because before I got to form one, bedwetting was never an issue. When my mom knew, she was panicking. Okay, how long has it gone? Do other people, you know that, what will other people say? You know, do other people know? And this whole idea around shame rather than how I was feeling about it. She's like, okay, I can't see anything going on, but I will prescribe this hormonal pill. That is Lucy's story, so we're going to be getting to it a little later in the episode. Let's jump into the song of the week. I'm really excited about this because he is definitely one of my favorite artists right now. And the song is Freedom by John Baptiste. I hope you love it. There's something about it, like when it plays and you just get up and like move your body, um, whether you have rhythm or not. <laughs> it's like really loosening this song. Yeah, I hope it has that effect and you'll put a link to it in the show notes. And he's really awesome. I was watching an interview of him and his partner post the Grammys and I didn't know that his partner was battling or is battling a terminal disease and he wrote her a lullaby every single day at a certain point in her in her treatment yeah and i was just like oh that that is just so kind but anyway check out his song freedom it's really awesome a link to it is in the show notes another thing that i think that you should check out that is not related to any music but definitely one of my favorite series right now i'm laughing because i keep thinking about funny things that happened across the seasons grace and frankie oh my goodness i love that show I love that show so much. In fact, like I've been binging it today. And once I'm done recording this, I'm going back to like continue. Please note, I had already finished watching it until season seven before the latest episodes were released. So I went back to start watching it again and then just discovered today that they're new episodes. So yeah, <laughs> it always puts me in a good mood. I feel like they handle a lot of important life themes. And I say that mid laughter <laughs> because it's just so absurd. In s <sighs> but it's it's a good show. It's really a good show. Like if you like that show, me and you can be boys. Okay, let me move on to something that's a bit more <laughs> deeper. It's something that I think I've been battling it for a long time. One of my closest friends is constantly calling me out on it, which is making decisions out of fear. And so if you are an old school legally clueless listener, you know that when I'm battling something, I like deep dive into it and just like look up all articles I can find about it, etc. So the reason before I share about the article that I found, the reason this is like an issue is that yeah, fear can help you kind of like give a decision a second, third, fourth glance, which is great. But for me and and I think when it becomes a problem is when it becomes the entire driving force, you know? So I'm trying to shift and spend as much time 
when it comes to decision making on the pros as I do the cons. Like I spend so much time on the cons and it's cons driven by fear that the pros just kind of like disappear completely and and it can be so paralyzing and you realize that either you're holding yourself back from from doing things or like you're doing specific things not because you want to but because of fear. Ugh. Anyway, so I did a deep dive, found an article that I'm going to share a link to in the show notes. And one of the reasons I'm sharing this is because I've never seen it laid out like this. Um, one of the things the article touched on is like what leads us to fear-based decisions. And basically they listed like five different motivators so kind of like underlying fears that you know fuel are very fear-based decisions does that make sense okay so the first one was fear of missing out on money which honestly if we look at in a business cycle at least for me I have had to call myself out and just say no to certain things no to kind of like overloading myself because sometimes those decisions is based on fear of like oh my god if I don't take this deal if I don't take this gig or this project if I don't get this money I'm not sure when next I'm gonna get money and that's not necessarily like a a bad motivator I think feel i think it becomes bad when you overload yourself or you find yourself doing things that you're not genuinely interested in or at least for me i know for sure when i've done this what happens is i get overstretched and it's just it's just ridiculous honestly (laughs) it's just ridiculous it's just ridiculous and it's not efficient it's not a rubbish fear but it can be addressed in a more efficient manner. The other motivator was fear of not being liked, which I did not think I had a problem with until very recently in therapy. (laughs) And not necessarily with strangers, because I think like the nature of my career forces you to kind of like draw boundaries between strangers and yourself. I think for me, it's people on the inside. So... When you look at family and friends, what are the decisions I've been making because of fear of disappointing some people? It's it's, people pleasing behavior. Yuck. But yeah, at least now I know. (laughs) And I'm trying to like figure it out. Um, But that one is a very dangerous one. There's another one, which is fear of judgment, you know, and you're making decisions Um, Because you're afraid of what other people might think about you. I think I do have that to some extent. I have bursts where it's like, "Ah, I'm just going to live this one life that I have. And then these times when I like hold back because I'm not sure what people will think. I get scared of judgment. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Definitely do have that one. But like on the days that it's not affecting me, I'm very aware that one, you're going to be judged anyway. And two, I don't know, life life is quite fleeting. Anyway, so I've put a link to this article that I feel was very insightful to me. I hope it's going to be to you. You might read it and just be like, what the heck? <laughs> I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Let's jump into 100 African Stories. And it's Lucy's story, who is such a cool cool person you'll hear her energy through her story as she's sharing it a member of legally clueless filled out the form and we hang out a couple of weeks ago and recorded this story of hers that has everything to do with adhd bedwetting and boarding schools a hundred african stories on legally clueless stories from africa um, my name is Lucy Wangare and I am from Nairobi, Kenya. So when I was in high school, it was my first time in boarding and my parents just dropped me off at this school I really wanted to go to and I'd spent sleepless nights, you know, the night before packing, you know, you're going to boarding school and I remember my cousins had told me about it and they had told me how it's so much fun. It's like being with your friends for a sleepover for an entire town and so I was excited and I had two other schoolmates who were going to that high school with. So I, I thought that, yeah, you know, I already have friends. You know, it's such a 
somewhere I've wanted to go to for a really long time. And so, you know, I was pretty op- optimistic about the next four years. But then when I arrived, it was very anticlimactic. I remember seeing a huge line of just, it, it was a girl's school. So you'd have about eight stations. So when you come, you sign your documents here and then you go to the next place and then you pay like that, like that. So when you got to going to the dorms, we called them houses. So when you got to going to the houses, there was no space for me. <laughs> I did not find a bed. Um, so what happened was the, you'd, you'd have a house mom. And so my house mom booked a bed for me that was already taken. And so that meant that, okay, so then I realized, oh, so I'm in a room with total strangers who are not my friends. I I, I struggled fitting in because um, I was from, it was such a contrast from where I was from in primary school. I, I stayed at home, everything was done for me, and now I'm literally thrown in the deep end. And so I remember, like, you know, my parents, we made the bed, we put my stuff in the locker, And so that was it. And so that was, you know, they were going and I was like, oh, so I remember at night, I was like, okay, so my parents are really leaving me (laughs) here alone um, in high school. Um, Yeah, and so now the first night I I slept and then I woke up and there were, you had four cube mates. So it was a room and then a fairly large room. And so there are two double deckers on each side, and then you had a table in the middle, and then you had a wardrobe on each side. Yeah, so I, I, three, my three cubemates were whispering to themselves, and so I was like, um, okay, I guess it's time to wake up. <laughs> and so when I woke up, my bed was wet, and I was like, okay, now how do we navigate? And so I was totally clueless. You know, you are green. You don't know. I didn't even know the names of my roommates. I didn't know where I was. And my house mom just left me. Mm -hmm. So usually you had a grace period, which is like one week of your house mom washing your clothes, doing everything for you. You're just existing. And... (laughs) and eating and and so she didn't do any of those for me so i was i was just lost and it was such an anti-climatic you know it's like when you've really really waited for this thing that's supposed to be high then it ended up being one of the worst moments of your life and so yeah so that i didn't know how to deal with that and so i dismissed it as a one-time thing and then it happened for two days and then a week and so i was like um okay and then you know i didn't i didn't quite know how to deal with it so i was i was a bit behind in you know like washing my clothes because i i was a very confused for one and the school is quite large and so uh, maybe i'm washing my clothes and then i hear oh okay it's time to lock the house and i'm like okay so where do i go now i go to the i do go to class okay class okay now we are going to eat <laughs> so I was totally lost and I was all over. And so I remember because of that, I had a fallout with those cube mates of mine. You know, that like they would they wouldn't they were in form four and I was in form one. And so they wouldn't I don't think they had the time or the patience to deal with me. And so they just left me alone. So I was like, okay. And so I I I moved. And so when I moved, the problem didn't stop. It just continued. Uh, and I didn't know what to do. And no one would offer help to me. They just ostracized me instead. And so I was like, okay. And I remember feeling very alone, very sad and questioning. Because, you know, from high school was supposed to be this glorious place where I get to meet all my friends, you know, sleep over every day with my friends, yeah, make memories, have fun, you know, eh, be free in, in some sense be better than primary school Mm -hmm. and so yeah i was just existing uh, sort of like you see how in cartoons there's this cloud that follows (laughs) a cartoon (laughs) like in tom and jerry how jerry is followed by this dark cloud hanging over his head and so that's kind of how i felt Mm -hmm. and you know how it would rain only on jerry and so that's 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 kind of how i felt why is it just me you know like I felt very alone. I felt very helpless because 
I didn't quite know what to do and no one was willing to tell me what to do. Uh, when I moved now, I moved to uh, to a room with two Form 2s and one other Form 1. So I wasn't alone. They were a bit more helpful. They told me, oh, you know, take your stuff out or, you know, wash. But it was with laced with some sort of disdain. Mm -hmm. So they're like, you know, see, you take them out. See, you wash your clothes. See, you do this, you do that. So I was like okay so i guess i have to do that and so it got slightly better but i think the moment it was a bad moment that ended up being good i, I don't know what you call those things uh those moments that you're like oh shit um and then it ended up being a moment of awakening so the matron caught me in the house um, and that was like kind of a big deal you'd be given a punishment and all and I was the only one. So you you'd, you were assigned somewhere to wash. And so I hadn't washed my place. I had woken up because my cube, my roommates had given up on waking me up. <laughs> so I just, you know, like, Ile, you just wake up, you know, and you're confused and you're very disoriented. What time is it? Why am I alone? Yeah, and so I was just rushing, you know, the morning hours. And then, you know, you have to bathe. I I met with the house. She's, she was called the housekeeper. So I met with the housekeeper. And so she was like, okay, what are you doing here? What is your name? Hmm? What what class are you in? And so she was like, okay, you sort yourself out and then go to the nurse. And then she, she kind of like cooled down and she was like, okay, so how long has this been going on for? You know, do your parents know? Has this happened at home? And so she sent me to the nurse. And so when I was sent to the nurse, the, I think those... There was something, there was, I was also sick, and so they told me, you know what, go to the hospital. It's not normal for someone past the age of five to be bedwetting. So I said, okay. And that's where my long journey in and out of hospitals, battling my parents began. Because my parents didn't even know in the first place. Because before I got to Form 1, yeah, bedwetting was never an issue, So, uh, which is a bit interesting. So I was like, okay. So I, I remember I didn't, I went to the hospital with my dad. Okay, my dad knew that I was going to the hospital for, I think I had a throat infection thing. He knew that I was, that's why I was going to the hospital, but he didn't know why I was going to, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. So I told, I told the doctor, like, you know, like, he, I think he stepped out or something. So I told the doctor and she was like, okay. So we're going to have to take you, it was in Getwoods, so we're going to have to take you to Getwoods Mudaiga. There's this, it's called a nephrologist, the one who deals with your kidneys. Yeah, because that's so normal and I, I can't find an explanation. So it's like, okay. So now, we're, by the time we're getting there, of course, now my dad knew. And my dad knowing, my mom knew. So I slept at home because I was going to see uh, the nephrologist the next day. Yeah, so I remember sleeping at home and it was chaos. Like, okay, n when my mom knew, she was panicking. Okay, how long has it gone? Do other people, you know that, what will other people say? You know, do other people know? And this whole idea around shame rather than how I was feeling about it, which made me quite distraught because, you know, like, it's supposed to be about how I'm feeling. There's something I'm dealing with. You're not with me in school. Yeah, and so, like, now that's when she told me, okay, yeah, so you need a Macintosh. You buy it. This is what you do. She bought me extra pairs of sheets. And now, like, she told me, okay, in school, this is what you do. But then that came with... Now I started associating it with shame mm -hmm. because I expected my mom to kind of, like, comfort me, but she didn't. Um, then we went to the doctor. Mm -hmm. She said that there's nothing going on. So I did all these tests. She's like, okay, I can't see anything going on, but I will prescribe this hormonal pill or something. And they're quite expensive. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd, she'd, she'd give me a time frame in which to take it. I think it was around eight. And then no three liquids passed five yeah and so it was it was a bit it was a huge task given that i'm in boarding school so i can't control my schedule i can't control when i eat when i have breakfast so you limiting my fluid intake past a certain time uh, is not ideal but you know it's like okay anything to you know because of the kind of like shame surrounded by it and naturally i have a very strong personality and i'm very outgoing so outside the house outside my room, you know, I'd have this bubbly lifestyle, you know, and then when I go back to the room, okay, 
I'm facing my roommates. You know, then that time I used to take my mattress out. So maybe it's it's like there's nothing. And you know, going, it's a boarding school. So going to each other's room, it's kind of like how you socialize. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, yeah, okay, which room are you in? And I was like, yeah, no, no, no. I think I'll <laughs> just go to you. I think it, it, it hindered like me being as outgoing as I should have been. And it brought this kind of shyness. And I had to sort of put on a facade and be kind of stoic about it. And I never really did tell anyone. So I was sort of like you're carrying this load and you're carrying it, but it's invisible. Mm. So everyone is seeing how, you know, you, you, your life is going great. Huh? You're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing the other and you're this and you're that. I was a captain from Form 1. And so, yeah, you know, now when you're a captain, you're sort of like held in a higher standard than other people you know you're a prefect you you're 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 in charge of people and you do all these things you know but then in the house you know i especially in my room i was there was a hierarchy and i was at the bottom yeah so that was it was really it was a huge challenge for me um so when I was taking my medicines in school, I put them in the nurses. The nurse had sort of like a cabinet. Mm. And so I put them in her cabinet so that no one would know. So I'd just go there, you know, say hi to her, take something. No one knew what they were for because they didn't even help. So she gave me a chart. <laughs> Nothing really changed. Because she gave me a chart to, you know, kind of like, you know, take these medicines at this time. When you wake up and you're normal, like you're not bedwet put this I think it was a silver star when you have put a gold star and you know like set x y alarms and so you know they didn't help so i found myself like it's the first time i went and i'd filled them in truthfully like you know all x stars and so she's like okay um okay so she amped up the doors and so yeah you know like my mom was telling me there's there's nothing wrong with you you know like you I think the the perception is if there's nothing physically going on, then it's just laziness. So, you know, you should stop being lazy. You should wake up. Everybody wakes up. Hmm? You should you should stop being lazy and you should just wake up, swallow your medicines. And so I, I began to lie. So I put, like, like uh, let's say gold stands for the day you've been wet and silver stands for the day you haven't. So I'd, 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 I'd have to be crafty with my patterns. So gold, silver, 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 gold, silver, 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 gold, silver. <laughs> He's like, okay, okay, okay. You know, they're okay. And my mom, even though we had insurance, my mom was like, oh, you know, it, this takes a lot of your insurance. You know, you, you need to, you need to step up, get off this as soon as possible. So I managed to l- lie my way out of that, but that didn't last so long. Because in school, uh, it would probably be a week or seven days. So maybe four, three times a week, t- let's say four times a week or three times. And then at home now, I think it would be like two times a week. I guess because in school there's a lot of pressure and you are uh, very fatigued. My mom, I remember her buying these alarms online, you know, and and it was it was kind of weird. I felt very humiliated. I felt very not understood because ideally your mom is supposed to be the one who understands you and tells you, okay, you know these things. You know, don't worry about them. We'll sort them out. And so, you see, we I developed a routine using alarms uh, that sometimes worked because sometimes I wouldn't wake up, you know. Sometimes it just had its own challenges. Yeah, and so alarms were very escapist because you're not really dealing with the problem. You're just avoiding it. You're not looking at, okay, what causes this? Just like, okay. But what thing is the issue? It is very uh, humiliating. So to avoid that, use X alarms, you know, do this, do that. And I felt very frustrated. It's like someone was taking away from my teenage experience because these are the times when you're free and you should socialize. So I remember, like, for example, I have a very, to date, I still have a very vibrant social life um, because I'm such an extrovert and I like, you know, relating with so many people. And so they'd be like, yeah, yeah, you know, come over for the sleep, sleepover or having a party. And I'm like, um, no, <laughs> I wouldn't even consider it. I'd come up with some things. I think I probably killed three grandmothers. 
along the way, you know, four grandfathers. You know, my, my grandmother on my mom's dad's cousin's side died. And so we have to go to Ushago. Uh, maybe next time. <laughs> because it was so closeted, I never really let anyone know. But then I had this friend who was kind of like going through the same thing, except we we actually had the same uh, nephrologist, the same doctor, uh, but hers was an actual condition. So I'm like, oh. So, you know, like we'd navigate all these things. And my school was a very religious school. And so you'd hear such great things like, you know, God is able. He can heal you. So I remember thinking, hmm, you God, huh? you're healing X, Y, Z. And then you're not healing me. When I'm a child, a PLO asks, uh, are Africans child of a lesser God? <laughs> so, yeah, I asked the same question. When I'm a child of a lesser God, eh? Ama, you don't, you know, hear me, those, those, it was sort of like religious gaslighting, like invalidating your experiences, because, you know, like, you just pray, you know, God heals and all those things, and it was very, it was such a turbulent moment for me, because all over I'm hearing this story and that story, and so I'm like, okay, so what's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. I just remember having all these sorts of just odd feelings um because i never really knew what it was and i was seriously convinced that i was really convinced that there was something wrong with me but you don't know how to explain it to other people so they can understand you because everyone thinks okay you know you're making excuses but it's so ironical that that metro in, in high school is one who used to understand me just to check on me and just to tell me okay so how are things going and so she used to you know, she used to even excuse me, okay, you're in the house late, it's okay, I understand. And so that that used to feel very precious for me. So fast forward to form three. So I had this friend, uh, I guess we're still friends. That's not so convincing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we had been roommates from form two. Eventually, we'd be roommates till form four. And so she, one day she just snapped. All of them, like, I I got this letter, you know, this anonymous sticky note in during one prep. And she was like, okay, I didn't know who it was from, but okay, uh, come to the QB. We are meeting with the, with the deputy house captain. And I was like, oh, shit, what can it be this time? So I just went and I am bombarded by, oh, you know, you've done this and you've done this. We try telling you this and this and this. But, you know, every day we wake up and you've just bedwetted. You can't, you know, do this and do this. You need to start waking up early. You need to start doing this and this and this. And it's affecting us. And if you don't, I guess we'll transfer you out of the house, something like that. And I felt very hurt because, first of all, she was my friend. I mean, we still talk, but sometimes some things don't change. I remember feeling like, okay, I spend a lot of time with you guys. Why couldn't you just tell me? Why do you have to involve someone else, like an outside party? And I think sometimes high school can be very a very toxic place. Children can be very, very toxic. Yeah, and so I remember that and I was like, hmm, okay. So that was that was quite strange. And I remember us kind of like just not talking about it, not talking to each other or with each other, just, you know, existing and just, yeah, like just you wake up, do your thing. Me, I wake up, I do my thing, we go. And I I received quite a number of those. Um, Some of them used to be anonymous. And I was like, okay. Like, what, what is this about? I remember one time, I think there was a time I, I had a marking touch just to make work easier for me and life easier for me. So I remember there was a time, I remember the time I went, it, it tore. So I went out, I used to put my mattress outside. So then when I went outside, someone had poured water on it. So you're like, okay, how do I start sleeping? Where do I sleep? So you see, um... I felt like there was a lot of unwarranted, you know, disturbance and interference just because they can. But those are people projecting their own problems towards me. Thankfully, no one ever came at me to my face. You know, you do this, except from that that incident. 
So sometimes I'd receive anonymous messages, such kind of things. And it was very odd. Our school was quite big. I guess we were almost 2,000. And so there was no teacher who could step in. There was no teacher who could, you know, like know these things. Probably every house had a teacher attached to it. So maybe the probably the teacher in charge of your house, but she never knew. And so it was just it was just like an internal affair. So you see the thing is prefects in such big schools they almost run the entire school because the school is too big and then the teachers are too few. So I guess the the government does not give you enough because it was a public school the government doesn't give you enough teachers so we had about 200 teachers to a 2000 student population so that's one teacher for every 100 students and our house alone had 110 students so you see the disparity so i don't there was no way a teacher could cater for just one student out of 2000 or almost 2000 um yeah so i no teacher ever stepped up i guess i also found my own way of like dealing with these kinds of things because I just like I, 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 I remember like after my my roommates called me out I, I just told them okay so why why didn't you guys come and tell me like to my face see I live with you every day why 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 would you have to involve her and not come talk to me directly yeah but such I, I guess you can say acts of hate or just out of spite they happened quite often but there were people i had some friends who are quite quite supportive and that was i think it was really nice i don't think i'd have navigated high school without them and we're still quite close yeah so there are just some who you know like just don't let it disturb you you know as long as you're just doing everything there's some who'd wake me up earlier yeah so you know like there's some who'd help me okay yeah i know you have a lot to do you know so let's just let's go, you know, like, let me help you, let's wash clothes together, and that, that really made my life easier, and you know, like, my matron, if I needed anything, I would just send her, that was definitely, made my life way, way easier. During high school, I stopped taking uh, the medications, I think that was in form, form three, because of that doctor and her, of course, they weren't working, and so I just stopped, and I just raw dogged the <laughs> <laughs> the rest of high school and somehow you know i got eventually you get a rhythm you get a way to deal with them you you find you make things work so i made things work although it was a lot of stress because you know uh, i went to a high pressure school where you really had to perform and i had there were a lot of overachievers and so you know and i was also a prefect so there was that aspect of having to keep up with stuff be on top of your game you know but now after i finished high school uh, i went to uni and i went to this university that is also very high pressure <laughs> i don't know what's it with me and high pressure institutions uh and i went to study law which is a very equally demanding course and so in the middle of in the midst of all that i think i broke down at some point and i i started crying for like having sort of like depressive episodes, really dark, sad, gloomy days where everything is grey. And you know, like you don't have any will to live. You're just going through the emotions of life almost mechanically. And then I'd have seasons where I'm happy. I do all these things. I remember I, I, I entered the student body in first year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> first year, first time student body. And you know, I was doing all these amazing things. I was in club X and Y. I was doing this and doing that and you know being really good at it and then now now the depressive episodes would come again and so at first i didn't notice the pattern and so i told my parents ah you guys you know i i think that there's something quite wrong with me and that i need to go for therapy and so at first they're hesitant because you know my parents are older i'm the first one and the gap between my my mom and i is 34 years so by the time i'm getting to first year they're already quite old for my age and so they're 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 part of like those generations where they don't they don't understand what therapy is and counseling is only for those people who've gone through really bad things like the terrorist attack rape victims and you know just and so and so i remember my mom asking me counseling 
Kwani what have you gone through? Huh? Is there something you're not telling us? Like no, I just you know I feel very sad and gloomy and I think they used to see it because at times I'd just like cry, go on like just burst into tears like total breakdown for absolutely no reason, like no reason known to me. I was just sad. And so when, I, when after my parents observed that they're like okay fine, uh, I guess we'll take you for therapy. <laughs> And so after a while they found a therapist. Usually in the first session you kind of like do a brief introduction, you know why you're coming for therapy, have you had it before? And so like after I had this discussion with my therapist, she had me do a couple of tests. Uh when the tests came out, it was ADH uh it was confirmed that I had ADHD and bipolar disorder. So you know first of all you hear these two things and they are such big words, you know, what is ADHD and what is bipolar? And you know the, the myths surrounding all this you know what is there in the popular culture you know bipolar okay I, I don't think i switch between two extremes i don't think i'm sad one time and i'm happy one time so adhd is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, there are different types of adhd so that is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder so there are people who are in atten- like there are, there's a category for inattention so there are people who have a short attention span they have difficulty listening to others difficulty picking out details uh, they're easily distracted they're very forgetful and they have poor organizational skills like they're disorganized they have poor study skills so they are a bit slow in school and so they're those who are impulsive so they're those who are very quote unquote energetic so they often interrupt other people they have difficulty with like patience and they are risk takers and they are somewhat hyperactive so they are in constant motion they cannot rest they cannot stay still and so they tend to be quite quote unquote reckless like you f- you forget things you lose things and you tend to shift from one task to another usually some of these things cannot be if you're not hyperactive if you're not and there's some who have a mixture of both and so usually it's it's spotted in schools in children so mostly boys tend to be hyperactive and also like there's that difficulty in learning so those are the things that are most commonly diagnosed if you're able to manage like for me i did quite well in school but i was very disorganized i was very i was very i was also a bit uh, restless in that i'd i'd be impatient um but these are not things that you would spot and not many people are educated on these things and so me was just vibing <laughs> i i never knew i never even knew okay i knew adhd existed but i i thought it was just you know people who have difficulty paying attention and so and maybe because of they can't pay attention they are slow in class um, and that's that's usually what happens when you're young and so i didn't i didn't suspect i had it i didn't even think about it and so bipolar disorder from what i understand is a mood disorder caused by sort of like hormonal imbalance which leads to a um, manic episode so episodes where you're high like you're in a high you feel like you're on top of the world you're invincible you feel like there's nothing you can't do and for real there's nothing you can't do during those moments you f- you take on tasks you usually wouldn't you are very you're a go getter who gets things done and then there are depressive episodes which are totally the opposite you know the name explains it you know you sometimes you lack your will to live and it it can even get you know you can even get suicidal and so i was diagnosed with both of those and now i'm on meds which makes things easier but before that i had to those are a lot of talking that had to happen uh explaining to my parents okay exactly what this is breaking free from the stereotypes because uh for example my dad had a had an incident once uh someone was acting a bit rowdy and so whoever was there told him you know don't don't worry about that person they they say that they have bipolar so that's that's <laughs> 
so that's the misconception my dad had about bipolar that you know people who have bipolar are just you know they can just go attacking they're very rowdy they can't control their feelings and yeah so th- there was a lot of counseling that had to be done there and making them understand look okay this is what your daughter is going through because i was living under my parents uh, still am and so you know that there had to be that education okay and that's why she needs medicines this was this what medicines do yeah and th- that was the same for ADHD and so i never knew that uh, bedwetting was a symptom of ADHD and it is not commonly put out there because uh, ADHD is on a spectrum known as neurodivergence and and so your brain is wired differently and and so that cognitive development is kind of slower mm-hmm. and so that's why you have things like bedwetting you have disorganization because of that aspect of neurodivergence and so many people don't know and i think it's quite ironic that i went to see doctors and they were just scanning physically and they're like yeah okay i don't think there's anything wrong but you can try taking this medicine <laughs> and they didn't work out um because it's a that even doctors are not aware that there can be causes that are not physical that manifest themselves physically because i know adhd and bedwetting is not the only symptom that manifests itself physically that you can go see a doctor but the cause is not uh, there's something wrong with you because it's a very sort of there's a way some doctors view themselves as mechanics or how healthcare is done uh, like you know like okay hi okay what part of you is wrong okay <laughs> yes where is the pain okay what can i fix okay then okay we fix you okay bye instead of sort of like restorative mm-hmm. and viewing someone as a whole being that okay we don't see a physical sign could it be mental and i think that there's a huge need for education even on that and especially with societal stigma because i i was diagnosed what five months after high school and so you know now i can't go now telling my high school friends oh you know now nah. so it was just adhd and not like starting to describe it to them and i'm sure i was not the only one because in high school there are quite a few cases mm-hmm. and so that means that there's quite a lot of undiagnosed mm-hmm. people i'm not saying that it's all adhd but that's just representative sample that for many other mental illnesses there's a huge number of people who go undiagnosed because of misinformation either they they have wrong information about these illnesses or they don't even know they exist or how it can affect them or how they manifest themselves um and so now i am much better uh, i am on medications i don't know uh, who came up with this myth that medications for your mental for mental health illnesses will mess you up because mine are going great yeah so now i'm 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 undergoing therapy and and everything is pretty much sorted out but i see a pressing need for education a pressing need for kindness and people just being kind even though you don't quite understand what's going on the ability to empathize with others and to reason out with them and to see okay okay this this may be going on i don't quite understand it but you know how can i help you are you okay you know and not even how can i help you just being able to listen and not judging someone for it or not ostracizing them for it okay so the medications totally stop the bedwetting like i it's not even you know there's this kind of fear that comes you know a literal fear of sleep uh because of the shame surrounding it and you know like all those experiences but now it's gotten much much better and you know like with therapy I'm able to deal with these things and process them better and just deal with all the trauma that came from that and okay with my friends in now that I'm in uni I have conversations around mental illnesses with them but broaching the topic of bedwetting is quite it doesn't quite come up maybe in recent times when we've had you know the cases coming up but besides that it doesn't quite come up but i i do say a lot about you know i'm just starting to now speak out about okay mental illnesses we are normal people and it's not like you know i've done anything different people with mental illnesses are not mad and they're just kawa people you know how you can have a stomach ache yeah yeah sometimes your brain gets sick that way also 
<laughs> and just explaining to people what this is and the stigma surrounding it. But maybe one day I will, you know, put myself out there. Uh, but for now, I don't. Uh, except when a friend, for example, had a brother with the same kind of problem and was like, no, just hold on the judgment when you win. When you reprimand a child for something that's beyond their control, it does more damage than good. And yeah, but now I'm just a kindness. I'm pro-kindness, pro-empathy. You know, you don't have to quite understand. And that's what I get. What That was my main lesson uh, from all this. Like, just be kind. Because the people who are kind really took me a long way f- because of all those negative emotions, all that negative energy around me and just having one person to be, you know, that kind of ray of sunshine and it doesn't cost much just to empathize even though you don't understand. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode. I am so humbled that Lucy just, you know, agreed to share this very important story with us. I think so much stood out. First, it's just like the ignorance that exists within the people we entrust kids with. That is so problematic. And then boarding school. So I didn't go to boarding school because my mom was always against it. And I think it's based off of her experience because she went to boarding school. But I, there's just too many problematic issues that pop up when we look at boarding schools from kids being beaten, just some practices that you wonder what, what, what lesson are you trying to teach kids with all of this violence? Yeah, I, I feel like. And then what support systems are there for kids in boarding schools? Another thing that also stood out for me in her story is just like the peace that comes when what you've been battling is given a name and there's like relief and understanding and then like remedies and solutions there's just so much peace I really identified with that bit in her story so super happy that Lucy shared her story with us and if you want to share your story as well on Legally Clueless in the show notes there is a google form for you to fill out and then I will get back to you on the email address that you fill in in the form so it better be the one that you check regularly another thing is you can catch this podcast on trace radio in kenya so just go to www.traceradio.co.ke for a list of all the frequencies and we're there every monday and wednesday at 1 p.m and 11 p.m and fridays at 1 p.m thank you so much for listening to this episode to the very end i hope this week that both you and i (laughs) try not to make a decision out of fear yeah let's try and let's try and make decisions out of rational pros and cons lists and of course hope that's it for this episode of legally clueless you can share this podcast with your friends you can keep it for yourself i'm not judging just make sure you're here next week for the next episode